Welcome to the In the Garage podcast by CarParts.com. I'm Mark DeGrass. We have a very special guest today. We have Freud Paget, the UX specialist uh, or UX specialist technical products at Bosch, which if you're familiar with Bosch, uh, tons of awesome products that we actually sell at CarParts.com. Uh, so we figured we'd have him on the show, kind of talk about you know his experience in the industry, uh, maybe some new parts coming out, uh, and some of his uh, kind of specialties that he talks about on Fred Talks. So welcome to the show, Fred. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. So, so let's, let's talk about the position itself, because I think, uh, you know, user experience, a lot of people don't really, you know, put that together with uh, car parts or, uh, you know, manufacturers, maybe. Uh, so let's just start with uh, what is a user experience specialist uh, at Bosch? Excuse me. Uh, well, the the user experience at Bosch is a uh, kind of a broad term. They, they use it for a lot of different things. Uh, a lot of it is really more dedicated to making things faster, easier on the internet, stuff like that. So for, let's say, my involvement with the uh, user experience, um, my previous bosses decided that they wanted me to be able to talk to the customers and tell them more about Bosch products, the features and benefits, why you should buy Bosch over brand X or whatever. So um, they started what they call Fred Talks. So there's YouTube videos uh, under Fred Talks out there. So you can bring up Fred Talks, alternator starters, Fred Talks, cabin air filters, Fred Talks, TPMS sensors. And we've got a series of those that we've done out there. And the, the main thing is to educate customers on our product. And um, also uh, kind of from a tech technical nature to help people out. Uh, a lot of times they, they have a car that's not, performing right, not acting right, and to try to tell them, before you just yank this part off and replace it, here's mm -hmm. a way to diagnose it, or here's something you should look at on this particular year, make, model, engine, a car, so that you don't put a part on and find out that you haven't solved the problem. So, I love that. Well, yeah. I, you know, a lot of people don't understand that that's kind of part of uh, working on cars is figuring out the problem and maybe yeah. replacing some pieces that uh, might not need to be replaced just to find out if that is the problem, especially with older cars, I'm guessing, right? Yeah. Well, and to be that's just, I'll say just the opposite. Older cars, oh, really? you, could, you, you could develop kind of a, like a sense of hearing. Or, oh. or uh, like like your own decision tree to say, well, if it's doing this, then check this, check that. But nowadays with the uh, computerized cars, um, there's a whole decision tree that you have to follow. And you've got check engine codes and everything. So you've got to get the, as they call it, a DTC code and say, what does that four digit or four letter code mean? And then you've got to go to this decision tree that starts telling you where to check the voltage or where to check this. And if this is okay, then go check that. And it's it's time consuming. It's very precise. I mean, it'll take you right to the problem. But a lot of like, let's say, first timers or do it yourselfers aren't aware of that, or they don't have a like. Bosch has a, a division that makes uh, tools, diagnostic tools. Hmm. We got one that's called an ADS six twenty five that you can plug in, and it it reads the codes and tells you what the code is. Um, they don't have that kind of equipment, and they don't really want to have it. They you know, they'll go to a retailer that says, well, we'll read the code for you. And if it says oxygen sensor, they're going to buy an oxygen sensor and throw it in there. But that might be the problem, but there might mm. be something else causing that oxygen sensor to, you know, give a, a bad reading. So I get it. So you're solving the, the symptom, but not the problem. Right, right. So that's that's where some of the Fred talks are going there to help help out people that run into those problems. And, you know, uh, even a lot of experienced technicians you think about it, the car comes into the shop, they're under the gun to diagnose it, quote the guy, and then get the car fixed and get it off the rack and get it out as soon as they can. And they can be great technicians, but sometimes it's just like, well, nine times out of 10, this is it. I'm going to throw that part in there and get it out of here. And then that's when they have an un unhappy customer. And <laughs> then again, the, the shop, you know, if the guy comes back and says, hey, it's still doing it, they don't get paid a second time. So, yes. you know, then they lose out. So. That's, ah. that's part of what the user experience thing is about is just trying to make things better down the road there at the at the customer and it's for you know our customer would be like car parts and your customer could be a shop could be a do-it-yourselfer you know we're we're helping you not having a guy come in and say hey i put this thing in and it's no good and you got to sit there and say well the customer is always right even though i don't think he is you know 
Yeah. Well, and even in that, you know, the customer doesn't necessarily want to be right. They want to have their problem solved. So the fact right. that they, they purchased the wrong part, you know, we want to take care of them. But I, I love how, you know, what you're doing is actually going into the more kind of user-friendly type advice versus, say, uh, a manual where it's like, do this and this and this and, you know, might not explain why or mm -hmm. some of the, you know, kind of issues that you're going to run into, even if the manual says that. And it's like, right. oh, well, you you have the 89 and the 89 actually doesn't do that and they didn't update the manual rights and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. uh, so now that's, that's awesome work that you're doing. Now, in regards to, uh, say, the do-it-yourself or going out and trying to fix a part and diagnose the part, uh, do you have any advice other than do it more often and get that sixth sense of of hearing or is it best to go to the, so you start with the codes. Is that where, yeah. where they usually the go? The codes is the best thing. And again, if you can go to most retailers or maybe even car parts where you have these little handheld held code readers. And if, if you get the code, um, you can Google them and mm -hmm. find out what that code means. And the, the nice thing when, at least when it comes to emissions related codes, doesn't matter whether it's Ford, Chevy, Mercedes, whoever, they all use the same codes. So it's not like, oh, I got to plug this in under the Ford code or under the Porsche code. It, they, they use a universal code. So it's going to tell you the same thing. Um, but at least that, that's the place to start. And again, uh, I don't know what people have access to out there. There's Mitchell, there's all data, there's different you know things you can go to to start looking at that year make model of car and saying, okay, if I got this code, where do I take it through on there? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think a lot of vendors are trying to provide as much information as possible, but again, the, you know, kind of practical application yeah. might be a little bit different. Uh, now in regards of, in terms of, okay, so you identify the part, why, you know, just for Bosch, like what, what makes Bosch parts better than say other parts and how do people kind of make that decision between your brand and somebody else? Well, <laughs> that's an easy question for me. You, uh, what people don't realize, and again, in, in the U.S., a lot of people think of Bosch as being parts for European cars only. Mm. Uh, there, you know, we've heard it a million times from our customers. Oh, I could put that in a Mercedes or a Porsche, but I can't. I can't use a Bosch part in a Ford or something like that. And what they don't understand is that Bosch is OE with all these car companies. Really? And so the parts that you buy from Bosch or that we supply through the aftermarket. They come from the same factories that the parts came from that went on the car when the car was built. Uh -huh. They're built to the exact same standard. We don't have, a, you know, a, a OE standard and an aftermarket standard. It's the same product. Uh -huh. you know? um, the only difference, um, the OE product would have, let's say, maybe a Chrysler logo on it, and we can't sell a part in the aftermarket with the logo or the part number. So it's sold as a different part number, but it's built to the exact same quality specifications, whereas... Um, another kind of common industry term is the white box product mm -hmm. stuff that comes from offshore somewheres. You and I don't necessarily know exactly <laughs> what country that's all coming from. And, um, I'll give those companies credit. They're very good at copying things. The things look a lot like the, the original part, um, they'll even function, but what is the life expectancy of that part? How long is it going to last? And, that's what people have to start training their mind to, especially like in my case, where I was telling you before, I put a starter on my truck that took five hours. Mm -hmm. You don't want to do that five hour tr starter again, six months from now, because the one you put in, you know, just wasn't that good. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's our big thing is um, innovation. Bosch has always come up with new technologies. And um, one thing that goes back to Robert Bosch himself over a hundred years ago is quality. We quality is like the number one thing in all of our parts. And we, we will not sacrifice quality. It's, it's yeah. going to be the first quality, best quality all the time. And that's, Love. that's the big thing when it comes to replacing that part in that car. And you're making that decision is, you know, which one should I put on? You got to remember Bosch has a huge engineering staff located all around the world hmm. that works with the car manufacturers and the car manufacturers or the truck manufacturers are telling them, this is the engine. Here's the parameters of what it's got to be able to do. Make me a part. Bosch works with them. And then we have a whole series of tests that these parts have to go through. Mm. They even have what they call five season testing, which once they've made a prototype and the manufacturer says, well, we think we like this. Then they actually put it on a car and they drive it 
spring, summer, fall, winter, spring again. So it's actually on the road for five wow. seasons, going through, you know, all kinds of, you know, weather and road conditions, everything to help prove that thing out. So. Love that. Yeah, well, I think that's uh, that's the only way to really prove it, because you could put it on a machine and run it 24 seven until you get to the amount of hours when it breaks. But that's not the same as somebody slamming on the brakes or, yeah. you know, exactly. driving through rain versus snow. So how does that process work? Is it just kind of like the you know, you have a set of employees that are like, hey, here's your car for the next you know, 13 months. No, or no, what, they, Bosch, uh, in, in several locations around the world, Bosch has test tracks. Okay. Where we, we own the facility and it might like, we've got a facility up in Minnesota where they're driving cars and trucks on the ice in the winter time for ABS and that kind of stuff. Hmm. They've got several tracks in Europe where um, cold weather parts of the country or the countries over there, they're running vehicles all year long because they want to be able to experience all the different weather conditions. And it's not just mm -hmm. the cold, high heat, humidity, you know, in the South. I mean, you're from Texas and stuff. It gets pretty hot and humid down there, and you got to make sure that the part that's working in Minnesota works in Texas, you know. Does your car seem to be running rough lately? It might be time for some new Bosch parts. As an auto industry innovator for over 130 years, Bosch is synonymous with quality car parts. Get your ride running like new again with spark plugs, oxygen sensors, alternators, and other parts from Bosch. Carparts.com has a huge selection of genuine Bosch components for all makes and models. Check out Carparts.com. Your car will thank you. Download the Carparts.com app and accelerate convenience with access to over 850,000 auto parts at your fingertips. We make it easier to find the parts you need anytime, anywhere. Get it now on the Apple App Store and Google Play. Oh, wow. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's all other, you know, levels of, <laughs> you know, yeah. testing. Because you also have like salt, you know, if somebody's next to the ocean, they might have to deal with, you know, salt yeah. water, which has a, a huge impact. So it has worked. So they do say they did the track test. Do they pull the part and then I'm guessing measure it? Or how do you actually associate the, the wear and tear? Well, I don't, I don't work in engineering, so I can't tell you all that because I, I don't really know it all. But again, yeah, there's they're taking it off and they're testing it on the bench. And then there's destructive testing where they take it mm. apart and start saying, you know, how is it after this much time? And they have, you know, oh, algorithms they can run it through and say, if it did this, that means it's going to last this long, you know. Mm. But again, you buy the white box stuff, you're not going to get any of that. That's where yeah. somebody took a picture of it at a trade show, went back to whatever country said okay here's one and it ought to work you know it's, yeah it's well, pretty hit and miss what you get out there you know? yeah well even just the you know the material science that goes into the the actual parts like it's mm -hmm. it's extremely complicated and using the wrong material won't have the same you know wear and tear and and the fitment is a problem so in terms of say you know going with the cheap solution what kind of problems could somebody run into other than it might break a lot sooner well, like something like you just mentioned about the materials. Now, from my past experience with starters and alternators, um, they're made out of, you know, combination of steel, copper, aluminum. And there are different grades of copper and aluminum. And some are a lot cheaper than others. So when they go offshore and they make this stuff, they're looking for a, you know, very low price to bring it in to sell it cheap. And that's when all of a sudden starters don't have the same torque. Um Alternators don't put out the same current because they're dimensionally, maybe they're the same, but th by using different materials, you don't get the same output out of them. Mm. So that's where you're going to start having problems where the cars are, especially like with an alternator. Um, just think about, uh, again, Texas in the summertime. You're driving, it's hot, you've got the air conditioning on, you got a defogger going, somebody's charging their cell phone, you got the radio on, not to mention the ECU that runs the, the whole car. It's, it's drawing current all the time. So the alternator's job and the battery's job are two different things. The battery's basic job is to supply power to the starter to start the car. And the alternator is supposed to be supplying current to the vehicle to operate the lights and the wipers and all that stuff while you're driving. Well, if your alternator can't handle the load, it actually starts pulling power out of the battery to mm. help while you're driving. And... Car batteries are not like marine batteries, golf cart batteries. They're not deep cycle batteries. So they're not meant to be ch discharged all the way down and then oh, brought back up. So, again, if somebody, you know, gets an alternator made out of inferior materials, it's going to get into this, what they call deep cycling. 
So it's going to wear your battery out and your alternator is going to run real hot and it's going to die a, an early death. And wow. yeah. again, there's some alternators that are pretty buried on a car. It takes a lot to get them out of there, you know? So. Oh, yeah. No, I remember that was uh, that was the first time. Actually, maybe the only time I changed an alternator was on a, a 93 uh, Mitsubishi Eclipse, which was super compact. And the whole thing was like buried at the bottom of the engine. So yeah. it was uh, it was a ton of work. And I think even in that case, no, no, that was the that was the fuel pump. Something happened, but I had to replace it because the part wasn't good. <laughs> and mm -hmm. I tried to drive it. Didn't work. I had to go back in. And that's. Yeah, probably the epitome of disappointing is after you do, uh, you know, a ton of work on a car and then be like, and it still doesn't work and you didn't solve the problem. Well, and, and, and the other one, think about um, a fuel pump. Most cars nowadays, your fuel pump is in the gas tank. So yeah. to change a fuel pump, you got to, uh, not all cars, but most cars, you got to drop the gas tank. Some cars have an access panel under the back seat, but the biggest percentage of them, you got to drop the gas tank. I live in the Chicagoland area. We call it the Rust Belt. If you get a, like, a, say, an eight or 10 year old vehicle, that is just a cake of rust back there. Oh. So now everything that you take apart to get the gas tank out generally breaks, you know, the bolts, the straps. So you've got to not only get it out, but you've got to replace all those parts, putting it back uh. in. And again, uh, when the fuel pump doesn't run, the car doesn't run. So you're stranded somewhere and you don't want to have to do that again. It's, it's a really nasty job, you know? Yeah. Well, then, then you get the, you know, the actual invoice back and you're like, well, we didn't just do that. Yeah. <laughs> here's, here's a list. Yeah, we of had others. to do all this at the same time. Yeah. yeah. But now you won't have to worry about it for, you know, probably until you sell the car. <laughs> yeah. And there again, like on the Fred talks videos, we get into um, our products. So we did a, a, a video on our fuel pumps and, Again, there's a lot of, uh, let's say, precious metals that are in a fuel pump. In the uh, the level uh, switch that sends the signal to the uh, gauge on a dash, there's platinum, iridium, there's all kind of stuff in there to make that stuff last and give it the right signal. Mm -hmm. um, you get it uh, off-brand, they're probably not putting that same stuff in there, you know? Off is expensive. <laughs> No, those are fantastic points. And I think, you know, uh, if people are considering that the super cheap alternative, like that's probably enough to not deal with it. And if you are selling the car, you should still do it just to be yeah. a good person, not set somebody up with a car that's going to well, break. And, you know, cars now uh, have, what do I think it's since 2007, have TPMS sensors, you know, for the mm -hmm. air pressure and a tire. We just launched our line of TPMS sensors, and we oh. have a, a, ru a rubber stem one, and we have a metal stem one. Um, but the metal stem one, when you go to install it, ours is different than all the rest of the ones out there. And we, that's part of the reason we did a video on it, because mm -hmm. it has an extra rubber seal on there to make it seal better against the rim. Oh, but nice. installers, when they go to put it in and there's a nut that they got to screw down, it starts binding up, and they think, oh, I got something bad. The threads must be bad. And that's where we're telling them, no, that's this extra rubber seal you're compressing, and it's going to seal better. And again, um, older vehicles, the rims aren't in the greatest shape. Uh, a lot You have a lot of not just steel rims, but you have cast rims. We have problems with porosities and stuff. So again, that extra rubber seal is, is it seems minor, it's kind of like a rubber O-ring, but it, it's really valuable in, in making that thing last and solving the guy's problems for him out there. Love that. Well, and, and actually, that's 